What's up guys, my name is Chris Ray. And I'm Martin Phobes. Welcome back to another Q&A with Motion Clubhouse. All right, what's up everyone? Thanks again for tuning in and so many questions. So uh, let's get right into it. We got some good ones today. Good questions, yeah. Thank you everybody who submitted. Um, this is our fourth one. How many of these have we done? Ooh, this might be our third. third this is our fourth? third, yeah. Okay. So Q&A number one. three. Yeah, thank you guys again for so many questions and showing us some love on social media. Well, speaking of love, this is somebody I love very much, Alex Lassen. She asks, is there, any, is there something you'd like to film that you haven't yet? Hmm. We should both answer that one. That is a good one. Um, that's a tough one. I th there's, a, there's a lot of things I think I want to film that I haven't shot yet. Like one would be, I'd love to go on like an African safari and shoot like, or not shoot, but film animals for like, you know, like a month yeah. straight or something. Like I think that'd be so cool to shoot or to film wild, wild lions and giraffes and all sorts of stuff like that. I've always wanted to do like a fitness commercial, like kind of yeah. typical, like you always see the shaky cam in a gym, like, you know, I love high, those. High, those are my favorite action, things to like, film. Yeah, yeah, I love filming those fitness, that fitness stuff. Um, my buddy Griffin Conway does a lot of that stuff. Um, something like that would be really fun to shoot. Yeah. Um, yeah, what about you? For me, I would probably say I'm a big Seattle Seahawks fan, so I'm a football fan. I would love to do a project with the Seattle Seahawks, whether that's like a player or their organization. So if there's anybody out there from the Seahawks watching, uh, you know, get in touch with us. I want to shoot that. Russell Wilson, if he's watching. No, 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 no. We're not friends with Russell Wilson anymore. He uh, he went to the Broncos. That's long gone. It's Geno time. So, yeah, we're moving on from that. So, touchy subject, man. Yeah. Way to start it off. Getting into my feelings. And I know we still like Russell Wilson. I just don't like him as much. I don't mean that either. I don't know what I'm trying to say, but it's a, it's like a breakup, okay? So, Next question. We got to get out of this. Okay. This one is from uh, Free Free Coaster Creative. Any tips for sound design? Ooh, don't ask me. I wear hearing aids, so uh, I <laughs> barely hear anything. So, um, best tips I could give is find a good library. There's lots of there's tons of free assets and stuff you can find online. If you are doing sound design yourself, try to f just fill every little tiny sound you can possibly fill. Like if there's a a latch, you know, like have a little tick for a latch, or if there's some sort of fast, uh, like, like motion or something, like fill that with a ton of sounds. Um, it's crazy how far or how much like a simple sound design pass will like bring your project to the next level. Um, one thing that we started doing recently was uh, working with this company out of LA called Racket Sound, and uh, they do they do great work they're super fast and they're really really cheap i think we use them on the polar pro project mm -hmm. um and we can probably just tell them how much can we tell them how much we paid no i mean i don't I mean, want to say cheap. i don't it's want like, to say it's cheap but it's very it's it, like a very it was very affordable for the projects that we work yeah. on where i feel like with what we get out of it it's a it's a very very fair price of, yeah. of what is getting returned like martin said like the sound is super important. Like one thing I learned when I worked at Transworld, when we were taking the VX noises, um, John, John Holland had taught me, if it sounds cool, it looks cool. So when you hear that stuff, you don't necessarily want somebody to, to watch a film or watch your commercial and go, oh, I really like this because of the sound design. You just want them to watch it and think, I really like it and I don't know why, you know? And the sound really helps with that. That was cool. It, what was it? it? If it sounds cool, it looks cool? Yeah. I like that. That's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah. That was John Holland talking about that legend. So. That's a cool one. Yeah. So, and, and, and you know what, uh, if you're not comfortable with sound or anything like that, whether that's even with a uh, hiring audio or things like that, like uh, let somebody that does, that does that for a living handle that stuff. I mean, that's, it's that important. It makes that much of a difference. So it's worth the money if you have to spend it. Uh, I do have one last tip for sound design. Um, if you're ever in doubt about your sounds and like the levels of your sounds that you're in there, always go on the more subtle end. Like if you if you have a sound effect in there and it's just like overpowers the music, overpowers everything, like it's gonna feel fake and forced. Yeah. So I always err on like the softer side of things when I'm filling sounds. So, you know, you like a sound here, but it's kind of coming through a little too too high, just bring it down and like like it'll like 
being subtle is like a good good thing with audio. And I've seen like. you actually uh, look at your your phone. You've listened on your phone when you export. Yeah. You listen on different computers. Uh, definitely before you export and send that thing off, listen on multiple devices. Yeah, and for me, I mean, I'm not a professional sound design guy by any means, but I, it's definitely a process for me of like I'll export, watch through, listen through, export, watch through, listen through, make little tweaks each time. And for me, I feel like it takes like three three rounds of like exports and just kind of like fine tuning things and things like that. All right, so our next question is from a good friend of ours, Chris Grabisa, and he says, where did the name Motion Clubhouse derive from? So very good question. When Martin and I were talking about doing a company, uh, I had an iPad, uh, he had a notebook. We were writing down just, just tons of names. I think I had maybe like 40 to 50 names. Uh, I would just write down uh, words that sounded cool, words that uh, affiliated with us. Um, I don't know how we got there, but somehow I think Motion got involved. Uh, club got involved and every time you're looking and searching for a name obviously the first thing you do is like you're looking at to see if the Instagram already exists or to see if the website already exists because obviously it's pretty tough to come up with a cool name and have it not be taken uh, the first time I looked up motion clubhouse uh, the Instagram it wouldn't let me register the Instagram and I was just like oh that's not an option so uh, I had registered motion club co mm -hmm. um, and then I went back and I just I wanted something that I was like I hope we can get this. <laughs> so I went and tried it again and somehow it worked on Instagram. I was able to get it, uh, registered the and trademarked the name um, and the rest was kind of history from there. I think like we both liked it immediately, I would say, yeah. right? I mean. I feel like it was, it was pretty fitting um, for kind of how we work and both Motion Club, it kind of has our initials in there too, which yeah. is kind of cool. We um, played a lot with like, oh, what, what's something with like MC yeah. or CM? And we had a, we had a long list going of, of names. And then uh, even when we reached out to Mark Wynn, uh, who used to be an art director at DC, and he did the logo for us. And we kind of just told him like what it meant to us. And it was like, it was really, uh, I think what the logo represents too is that it's kind of like this, this like clock with like a roof. And it was almost like, hey, it was like time to go out on our own and create our own yeah. thing because we were under a, a, a different company and working for them. It was like kind of time to go out on our own. So it was pretty cool. Yeah. Coming up with the name is really hard. Really hard. We like, I think we were traveling a lot of the time and we we're both just on the plane or wherever. Yeah. We we're just like writing down different names, different ideas. Yeah. I would yeah, pass was... over the iPad to him and he would like look at him and be like, <laughs> nothing really clicked, you know? So it was, it was a fun process. And I mean like the, I absolutely love the name, love the logo. Uh, everything it represents so i'm pretty happy with it yeah it's pretty cool seeing it all come together okay this next question is from drew t43 what's your favorite part of the creative process would love to hear you uh each of your answers um hmm. for me i think my, i mean the whole process is so fun like you get to work with your friends and then it's like you're putting together this puzzle and then you see the final result like mm -hmm. I don't know. I kind of like the whole process. I can't think of like what specific part I like the most. I like I like that the creative process isn't just one thing. It's generally like you brainstorm it, you go and shoot it, and then you put it together and you work with it post. It's like a whole process, not just like I'm going to go be creative on this one thing. It's mm -hmm. I think it's 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 a lot of things. I don't know. Um, yeah. Your favorite part of the creative process? I'll, I'll go into one. I mean, I'll use a, a recent project we did with Polo Pro. Um, as an example, and the creative process was like very smooth up until the shoot, right? And during the shoot process, uh, we ran into a lot of issues that we didn't think were, were gonna happen on set. And my favorite part of that was actually seeing how the entire team and crew came together to figure out how to fix the problems. I mean, that was the highlight of the whole shoot and, and what I'll always remember from the shoot is that nobody backed down, everybody was like, I have a solution for this problem. And I was on set and I heard somebody say one time, like uh, you could just tell something was happening off to the side and there was a problem. And I remember the director, you know, walking over and saying like, hey, is there a problem? And the guy said, there's only solutions. And that's exactly what happened on our set. So uh, to me, that was like a recent example of something that I was very happy with. Uh, but, you know, seeing everybody satisfied is my favorite thing. Like yeah. everybody puts in a lot of work and seeing everybody go, I'm happy with it, I love it, and I'm proud of it. That's that's my favorite part. Yeah. I think another, I mean, I, once again, I like the whole process, but um, I think 
Another thing I do really enjoy is sometimes we'll be tasked with, you know, maybe it's like an old project and we'll have to repurpose the footage in a new way. And I really like kind of just the process of having having something that's literally nothing yeah. and then it's be, it becomes something and it has like a clear vision and it's it's almost like the process of creating something from nothing. Yeah, absolutely. Thing, um, which every now and then those projects come along. It's not a... We, we get that freedom yeah. a lot, actually. I think yeah. that because of the work that we've done, <clears throat> people kind of come to us with like a general guideline and then from there we do get a lot of freedom to kind of build something. It's I don't know if I've ever, ever really edited something that was like fully storyboarded out of like... It's very clear. Usually it's like, these are the pieces, make it cool. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's like, once again, the edit, there's so many things that yeah. can change or you might find a clip that might change the way the whole story flows or I don't know. Totally. So we do our next question. We got, ooh, this is this is a childhood <laughs> friend of mine, Fro Dizzle. Funny uh, story about Fro Dizzle was that uh, I made a uh, local Reno skate video and we were out filming his trick and I knew it was gonna be the last trick in his part, right? So what I did was uh, he did his trick and when it when he rolled away, I actually put my phone in front of the camera and it said calling Javel and it had his phone number in it. I didn't show him the part, so at the premiere, everybody saw, I basically leaked his phone number out to everybody. I would always mess with Javel on things like this. I don't know why I did that, but it was like, I thought it was funny and he would get a lot of calls from kids at a local Reno scene and be like, I can't believe it, it's actually you. So uh, he got me back though. He, he, I think he put my number in a lot of like 24 hour fitness boxes and I just kept getting all these calls and uh -huh. yeah, it was, it was a mess, but Javel, um, sorry for that. I love you, man. <clears throat> so uh, Javel asks, um, do clients of yours trip out on the fact that everything you guys do was self-taught, not coming from a college education background? Uh, no. So. I think your work really, really shows. Um, I've never had anybody ask me about my high school or college background. Um, I, well, the college background doesn't exist for me personally, so I hope they don't ask, um, and I hope it doesn't matter. I think that you know I put in enough hours um, and yeah. showed what we can do. So yeah, it's definitely a different industry where it is all about your work, and it's about your work and what you have to show, and also how people like to work with you. Um, that type of thing, that type of stuff travels and mm -hmm. like people know, if people love to be around you, then like people are gonna wanna bring, bring you around on set and you know, if you do good work, then that's perfect. Yeah. Um, I don't think, I mean, like if you were the yeah. number one graduate from a film school, like, I mean, good for you. And I, I definitely think some people uh, need education um, and college education. And some people are just kind of like ready to go and dive in and figure it out. And that's how I am. I'm not a school person. I'm not a good book person. Um, I can't, I'm not patient enough. Uh, I like to just focus on this, get going and that's it. But yeah. some people uh, do well from it. I went to school, I have an associate's degree in like a film program in Michigan. And since moving to California, nobody's ever asked. <laughs> like it's never come up on any sort of project. So, um, I, it was like a goal for myself to finish finish college and it was like a big deal for my mom so I like went through it and did it but nobody's ever asked. <laughs> it's all about the work you have and the people you know kind of thing. I was on a set one time and uh, the drone operator, somebody asked him, they said, hey, what, what school did you go to? And he goes, oh, I went to YT University. And the guy goes, oh, that's awesome. I think my, my cousin went there. And then I remember later on in the day he said, uh, he said, hey, where's YT University? And he goes, YouTube University. And we just laughed. I think that was amazing. So yeah. I think we all graduated from YouTube University. So yeah. thanks, YouTube. Definitely learned a lot more from YouTube than I did in school. <laughs> like, dude, school, like, they taught everything to Avid. Yeah. And we'd have, on our tests, it would be like, memorize keyboard, The you have to memorize the keyboard shortcuts for like the default like mm -hmm. layout. It's like, what editor, re like, you of course go in and change your custom shortcuts yeah. like it was it was kind of silly but some but, some people need education so don't take this yeah. as like a, a hint to drop out and just run away to your dreams i remember in third grade we were doing like keyboard class for you know typewriting and mavis beacon uh is that what it is yeah. i don't know i don't remember mavis what it beacon. is but i was definitely the the kid in class going why are we doing this i'll never need this i don't need to know this uh me memorize typing without looking so I was definitely wrong on that. Yeah. 100% yeah, wrong. The software, the one, the software I'd use is called Mavis Beacon. And then I, they'd put like a box over your keyboard yeah, and you yep. have to go through and do like type stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was the same wrong. way. I was like, well, I was like, what am I going to use this for? Like, 
All I need to know is uh, Command Z. Yeah. <laughs> Undo. Yeah. Chris Grabisa, another question. Um, how has skateboarding impacted the way you operate as a business? Ooh. Um, I think, so it's like once you're a skateboarder, kind of always a skateboarder. And like, I think the way that we work and the way that people know we work is we're nimble, we're like, we can do a lot. We can kind of, we can kind of do it all. Uh, we're not, we don't have like, what's the word? Like high. Uh, we don't take no for an answer. Right yeah. Now. It's like if we'll, we'll just, we'll make it happen kind of thing. And that definitely comes from skateboarding. And uh, I think it definitely benefits us as we carry over into like this other, you know, pathway for us. Um, yeah. Well, I think also being a skateboarder, you, you, you try a trick over and over and you're used to that like failure, you know what I mean? And I think in other people in life don't get that experience of failing as much, right? And our at skateboarding, not landing a trick, like that's not considered a failure, but I think that it gets our brains to understand like it's okay if it doesn't work out right away or super easy. So that's probably the biggest lesson I've learned. I mean, skating is like 90% failure. You know, it's like totally you, you live and you progress off that small 10% say of like lands and wins, you know, and like mm -hmm. being able to kind of work through those failures and like put in the work to get past those failures to succeed. That definitely carries over into and, everything. And, life, and, you know? and skateboarders are like, they're so creative and driven that I think it just rubs off on, on, on each other. You know what I mean? And, and I think that what we're seeing now is that when you go to like work with an agency or if you're on a film set, that person comes from skateboarding also. So like everywhere you go, like everybody was involved in skateboarding at some capacity at their life. Yeah. And like Martin said, like once a skateboarder, always a skateboarder. So I'm seeing a lot of people where it's like, oh yeah, I used to skate or I skate or I love skating or I follow skating. And that's like, you immediately have this like bond and connection and you're like, you, you understand each other. So it's, it's definitely impacted us a ton. We've had like, we've had jobs where people like, they want to hire like skater, yep. cr like a skater crew, be just because they know that how nimble and how like hardworking they are. And yeah, it's pretty interesting. It's crazy. And this is from Fro Dizzle. Is there any other vital tips or important information for creators and videographers that you wish someone told you before you got into this business? Um, oh man, there's, I feel like there's a lot of stuff. Like I just wish I knew going into it, but um, probably a big one would just be like, believe in yourself, be confident. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's very easy in this industry. And like when you're on these big sets or these jobs to like, be like, I don't know, like, not believe in yourself almost. Yeah. You'd be like intimidated by the set and things like that. But it's like, if you go into it just being confident, knowing you can do it, knowing you can know, like, well, first you gotta know, you gotta be reliable, you gotta know your stuff. Mm -hmm. But if you go into these shoots knowing that, then nothing can kind of stop you. Um, but what other things are like? I think just be patient. You know what I mean? Be patient, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, understand that like, this could take a while to make happen, but, yeah. but like, Remember, like you, you do certain things that plant seeds and those are important to, they will get you somewhere else. And you may not realize it. Like, I think you really have to take a look back and go, why did I get here? Oh yeah, because I did this and this and this. And you have to understand like your past is like, is deciding your future. So make the right decisions of what you want to do um, and just go for it. If this is what you want to do and, mm. and this is what you believe in, like, I think we are proven examples. You can do this. Yeah. And it's, I mean, you kind of mentioned this too. It doesn't, it's not like an overnight thing where it's mm -hmm. like, you're just going to figure it out and make it in a night. Like it takes years and years and years and years. And I mean, Chris and I have been, Chris and I have been doing this for probably 10 plus years. And it's like, we're just to the point where we did step out on our own. And now I feel like we're actually going to like, it's you just know, starting. grow and we're kind of just starting, you know? Yeah. So it's like, it's a never ending process, but and also, um, also like the biggest thing I learned um, was do what gets you excited, right? So don't spend a bunch of time investing in something or uh, your time into something that you you hate. There were certain things that I was doing or trying out and it felt like homework to me. And I just was, was not looking forward to it. I didn't want to do it. And I immediately told myself, I'm not doing those things. Like if I don't get excited about it, I'm not doing it. It's just how it is because I don't want to get really good at that and then have to keep doing that. Like that's not that's not what I was in it for. So um, 
definitely like pay attention to how you feel and, and what you want to do, not what somebody else is telling you to do. Yeah. Another one too. Yeah, sorry, I'm going to go back up to that one. Yep. So like, I think this has kind of came up before, but it's say, say you want to be a skate filmer or mm -hmm. something like, say that's like, you're like, I want to be a skate filmer. Well, like go do kind of go do the work, go film, like have something to show for it. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not like you, you got to go kind of do these things on your own. You got to kind of make these things happen. Um, whereas I think, I think you kind of mentioned that. Yeah. I mentioned before, that on like, like the five tips episode, which we'll put in the link, but it's like, if you want to do something, my question is, well, what are you doing to make that happen? Like, what is it that you're doing? If you want to be a skate filmer, are you going to the skate park to meet up with the skaters and filming them? Like that's probably step one, right? I mean, watch a lot of skate videos, figure out what to do and not to do. Yeah. Things like that. So good question. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks Thank for, you, Javel. Thanks. For Miss you, Disney. man. Oh, this is another one from Chris Garbisa, and I like this question because I don't think many people know this. So he says, how did Martin and you meet, and what's your favorite trick? Can you perform the trick? So <laughs> I'll answer the first one because he's a way better skater than I am. So uh, the way Martin and I met was I was working on a project for, uh, for Red um, that was teamed up with the barracks and basically they gave us a red camera for six months and they said go out and create whatever project you want and it was like a, a film contest type thing with uh, the, some of the top filmmakers in the skate industry and my goal with the project was to go out and there was this assumption that with a red camera you, there's a lot of things you couldn't do right you couldn't film lines you couldn't film at night you couldn't edit on a laptop um, you couldn't go like handheld. You, it, it had this weird assumption for a while that you needed like a whole Hollywood film set in order to operate one of those cameras and it was really difficult. So my goal at the contest was to still try to make a good video, but I wanted to do all these things that uh, they said didn't work because I wanted to decide if this was something that I can use in the future. Well, during that process, I was filming with uh, Bobby Sorich was coming out with a, a kid named Jordan Grace who was in the project. And one night, uh, Martin came out. I don't know, I think because you're we were, just friends we were, with Bobby. Bobby and I, I think we're roommates at the time. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so Bobby was like, hey, my friend Martin wants to come out. Do you care? And I was like, no, I don't, I don't care. Tell him to roll out. So. Uh, Martin rolled out and he was just immediately like helping with everything throwing the generators over the fence uh, Lighting up the spot uh, was just super down. So you spent probably like what maybe How many nights a week did we do? It was probably like a probably like a week of going out mm -hmm. and maybe yeah something like that Yeah, so it was like a week of going out and I but didn't al also the project was only at night, right? That's true. So we hit yeah. so yeah, the project was only a night which was actually a nightmare uh just because it was like i had to stay up late and i'm not a super good night person so i remember doing that and i'm like why did i decide to do this project at night so uh yeah so martin was coming out at night helping Fun, out funny story about that so while that whole week uh -huh. that that was going on i think chelsea's um family came to town oh really and so they were in town staying at our house like that whole time and then so chelsea was like i mean she had explained to her parents like i was like because i was leaving at like yeah you know, 6 p.m. and I wasn't coming back until like 4 a.m. or something like every night. And her, her parents are like, like, what is this guy doing? Like, yeah. what's up with your boyfriend? Like, why is he just yeah. leaving all night? Like, what what the heck? So. Well, sorry, Chelsea's family. I didn't yeah. know any of that. So, <laughs> yeah. So he kept coming out and um, I just immediately saw that he was like a hard worker and just quiet. dude. Like, I don't know. He's quiet, hard worker. And uh, I think I offered him a job like on that at that week. Right. I think I was kind of like, hey. Do you want to come work at DC? Like, it was, it was probably it probably was pretty quick. Yeah, I, I was working for, so I was working for this agency in Dana Point called the Armory, and it was like automotive. It was an automotive agency, so they did stuff for like NASCAR. They did like stuff for like oil companies. Um, and I was, dude, I was on a shoot in Louisiana with the guy from Duck Dynasty. Uh, I forgot the guy's name. The guy with the big beard. I like, remember that. Some like, I don't know interesting stuff and i was like i'm a skater and like how, how am i shoot why am i shooting this stuff right now but i remember i was on this job and chris called me and he offered me the dc thing and it's skating i, I like skating and it was like of course i knew who you were because i grew up with your skate videos playing in my skate shop and stuff that's pretty and, cool and uh i was like dude of course i'm down like i'm gonna come out and help this dude like anything i can do like i came from like a farm town in the middle of nowhere in michigan like you never know where something's gonna like lead so whatever you do go in, go all into it and like I don't know. Good things will happen. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So uh, the other part of that question was, what's your favorite trick and can you perform the trick? What you got to, I'm going to guess your trick. Okay. Is it like a flip trick? 
Um, I'd guess a heel flip, because I see you flip heel flips every now and then. Okay. Yeah, you know what? That probably is my favorite trick. I grew yeah. up as like a hill flipper. Lindsey Robertson? Uh, no. I mean, Lindsey Robertson's awesome. <laughs> but like, it was one of those things where uh, this kid taught me how to skate in my driveway. And uh, he's like, there's kick flips and there's heel flips. And for whatever reason, heel flips just worked way easier for me. And I've always been like, been able to pop them high. When I do them, some people are always like, whoa, like you can heel flip high. And uh, I suck at kick flips. And I don't know. I mean, I do know why, because I always heel flipped. So um yeah. yeah so i'd say hill flip was actually front blunt is what i was thinking because that's mm. like the the like best like i guess uh hardest trick i can do like on a flat bar but um heel flip is is probably my favorite trick i definitely yeah um, let, me, let me guess yours uh it's a hard one you you do a lot of it's cricket like grinds. yeah it's like yeah it's like a cricket grind or just a straight up kick flip this is our homie gilbert aguilar for skateboarding, is there a shutter speed you like shooting? Do you change it for slow motion tricks? And I th think, yeah, um, I think, f I'm trying to remember skating. Like, was it 250 for like lines and then you crank it for slow mo? I think we were going, uh, oh, it was 250 man, it's, it's one of those things that like I can't remember unless the camera's in front of me, but it was a, uh, so usually, obviously, like you own a 180 shutter on like a typical you know camera right that's yeah. what people run but <clears throat> but in skateboarding we're shooting uh in 60p right so a lot of times we're shooting 4k 60 and i'll crank the shutter to uh 90 that'd be right 90 i think we do 90 for regular skating 90 for regular 45 skating Five for a trick where we want we know we want to slow mo and that way your that's what it is so faster. 40 we'll, we'll go 45 degrees if uh if we know we're gonna like slow mo it and then I'll go 90 if it's a line that I'm, I uh, just want it to look a little faster. Even go back to that 180 if there, if it's like a skater that skates slow. Yeah. But 45 is usually what we do in 60p, which I know a lot of non-skate filmmakers out there are probably throwing up behind the camera. And I apologize. This is the way we do it. We shoot in 60p. We edit in a 30p timeline. It makes everything uh, much easier to like choose yeah. your frame rates or uh, slow mo. Also, like if you if you shoot in 60 and then edit in 60, export in 60, it Dude. just kind of looks crazy. It yeah. looks like a soap opera or something. So it's bad. Shooting if you shoot in 60, edit in 29.97, then it gives you a lot of flexibility for you can just play it back. You know, it's you can play it back regular motion or yeah. you can slow things down. To it's a good meet in the middle. It makes it makes it look pretty yeah. good. Yeah. Um, and then another thing too is like if you are shooting a low light situation, like you're filming a line at night or something, uh, we'll go even lower. You know, like we'll go uh, like a, a 180 degree shutter or something if you need to. And basically, what that would mean if you don't, if you're not familiar with like the shutter angle, it'd be say you're filming 60 frames a second, your shutter angle would be like one over 120, uh, would be a 180 degree shutter, and that's like what you could do like at night or something. Hope that answers your question. Thanks, Gilbert. The next one we have is from Princess Poro, our good friend Mariah. We love her. All right, she says, what do you hope the future of Motion Clubhouse looks like? Um, I think it's just keep growing, keep doing stuff that we're happy about, excited about, uh, keep building our team, uh, yeah. keep building each other, and you know. I'm, it's, I'm it's... all about the products. We're gonna make new hats, we're gonna make new shirts, <laughs> and we're gonna make new, I'm just kidding. Um, it would be just... cool if we could sell some stuff. That'd be awesome. <laughs> um, just want to grow with our friends and yep. just make cool stuff and um yeah just be happy continue to be yeah. happy just continue what we're doing and staying on this path and this mm -hmm. path seems to be kind of going up so i think we're we're doing all right i think we, we got something good going yeah thank you for the question yeah uh this next question is from tl films what's your standard workflow for projects you seem to use different cameras c70 gopro fx6 red quite hard to match edit files slash color um yeah, good question. Um, so nowadays we mainly, sh we have, Chris and I each have a couple C70s and we each have reds. Most of our kind of day-to-day -day shooting um, is just done on C70s because uh, they're just kind of power horses of the camera. They can do it all, built-in NDs, autofocus, like they're super, super easy. And then if we're having a bigger, uh, like a bigger client shoot or a car rig shoot or something, we tend to use the reds. Um, and we have had a few projects where we have mixed the media with C70 and red and I haven't had a hard time, um, kind of matching from what I've kind of noticed is like all the newer cameras today, even between like Canon and Sony, it's like all the camera, the cameras and the colors are just so good nowadays that 
for me, I think it's, it's, it's pretty easy to match and get a similar, you know, kind of look across the footage, especially if you're shooting log across the cameras. Um, so I just think nowadays, like cameras are just so good that it's a lot easier to match than it used to be. Like years ago, I'd get Sony footage and it'd look crazy. Like there's no way I could get it to match, you know? And nowadays, like even on, yeah, I actually had, a, we had a project, this too shall pass. Mm -hmm. And it was Sony FX6 footage, Canon C70 footage. And there was like red Komodo footage in there. And it all blended and mixed, I think pretty well. And uh, I don't think anybody would really even notice. This next question is from John Wagner. Did you guys have clients you knew you wanted to continue working with and you started Motion Clubhouse? Or was it like starting from square one all over again? When Chris and I first left DC, we were lucky enough to kind of form a retainer deal with DC. So we didn't just leave DC to go to no clients at all. We, we had a very smooth transition into a freelance form of contract with DC. So that continued for six months. Mm -hmm. um, so we were lucky to have that. When the, the biggest thing with all of, with this question is like, the whole time we were at DC, we were constantly working with other brands and our friends and other projects, you know, on the side in anticipation for one day that we would leave DC and we would have to go out and find these jobs on our own, you know? So we did already have a really good network of friends and people we've already worked with that once we knew, once they knew that we were available, like we just kept on getting calls after calls after calls. Like, yeah, it got to the point to where, I mean, with, with DC support, and, and the bosses over there, we were able to do freelance on the side while working full time for a company, which is very unheard of. So we were very thankful for that. But what happened was that what we expected, and I think what everybody else expected, was that one would start to outweigh the other. So it got to the point to where we were getting called three times a week uh, without even reaching out to people to try to work. And obviously uh, freelance and doing your own business is more money than a company will pay you a salary. That's just the way it is. And uh, it, it outgrew our full-time positions. So uh, it got to the point where we had to decide, okay, what is it that we wanna do? Uh, this makes sense, the timing is perfect. And again, with DC support, they're like, hey, you know what? Well, we don't wanna just completely lose you. Why don't we work out a retainer deal? So we stayed with DC for an additional six months, still worked on their content. And during that time, we were able to, to really get uh, Motion Clubhouse growing uh, really quickly, to be honest. So we were in a very good position. Yeah, very unique opportunity to have a transition from being an in-house employee for 10 plus years to freelance. It was like the smoothest transition you could ever ask for. All right, everyone, so that's all the questions. Thank you so much for tuning in, submitting questions, listening to our answers. We really appreciate it. And as Gage behind the camera always says, make sure you like and subscribe.